is the Unit 2 AP Macroeconomics Review. So this unit, we really get into the pure macroeconomic topics. And the first one is one of the most important topics for the AP exam. GDP, what counts, what doesn't count, and how we calculate GDP. So GDP measures the dollar value of all final goods produced within the United States in a given year. So what this means is it has to be made here in the United States, doesn't matter who makes it as long as it's made here. It has to be made in the year it was calculated, doesn't matter when it sells, it matters when it's made, and it has to be a final good, meaning the resources used to make the good don't count. But let me break that down a little bit more by the formula for the expenditure approach of GDP. Now this is the primary formula you use on the AP exam, but by formula it's the CIGXN. You may also have questions on the income way of measuring GDP. This isn't as important, but note that there is another way of measuring GDP by adding everyone's incomes together instead of CIGXN. One's just through the product market, the expenditure approach, and one's just through the resource market, the income approach. But since they're both parts of the circular flow model, they end up equaling the same number and we can just focus on one. So these four components pop up for the entire macro course. The first one pops up a lot because it's the largest component of GDP. It makes up typically two thirds of all four components, the consumption component. This deals with just goods and services consumers buy on a daily basis. So you go out and buy a cup of coffee, you get your hair cut, that would count under C. Also under C is your income and under C is paying rent. So if you're renting an apartment to live there, that would count under C because you're just renting to temporarily use that place. I is investment or gross private investment. And gross private investment tends to be the one that people mix up a lot because they try and put financial transactions in there. But again, remember it has to be produced. So it's things produced that count as investment. And it ends up only being three things that count as investment in GDP. Total capital, which is machinery and a new factory. Inventory, these are items that are made but do not sell. Because remember, as I mentioned before, it has to be made in the year it counts in GDP. So if Old Navy produces a thousand pairs of jeans in 2018 that don't sell until 2019, it counts in 2018 GDP as inventory under investment. And the final thing is a new home purchased or produced. A home being purchased or produced is kind of like physical capital, but from the consumer's perspective. It's investment that can pay off. You own that home over time. I is important because it has a direct correlation to long run growth. So that focus on investment in GDP directly relates to long run growth. So keep that in mind, because if I ever ask based on the change of investment, what happens to long run growth? If investment goes up, long run growth goes up as well. G is government, and you'd think the government would be a large component of GDP, but to actually count in GDP, the government has to be receiving a good or service in return, which means all government handouts do not count in this. Another two ways of saying government handouts are entitlement programs and transfer payments, all used to show the government giving out something without receiving a good or service in return. So welfare, social security, unemployment compensation are all great examples of the government giving out money without receiving a good or service in return. What would count would be like if the government bought a tank because they're receiving a tank in return. Or if the government pays a postal service worker salary, they're receiving a service in return. So those are the only parts of G that count if they're getting something in return. The XN, the last component, stands for net exports. This one can be tricky because really the best way of looking at it, the formula is exports minus imports, but I like to think of it as exports count and add to GDP. Imports not only do not count in GDP, they actually subtract from GDP because it means a good is was produced in another country. And that means it'll actually end up fitting in the other country's GDP and not ours. So exports count, imports not only do not count, they subtract. Other things that don't count that I haven't listed, anything used in second hand, anything not made this year, intermediate goods, these are resources. I said it has to be the final good, which means the resources don't count. Financial market are those money transactions that nothing was produced, like stocks, bonds, loans, savings, they don't count. Non-market are things that you 
don't report as income to the government, and that's why they don't count. So if you babysit, but don't pay taxes on it, or the black market would be non-market. And anything produced in a foreign country does not count. So knowing what counts and doesn't count will end up being very important and very commonly asked. The next thing I want to go over is how we calculate GDP, and there's two ways of looking at it. You may see a statistic with nominal or real GDP, and it's important to know the difference because nominal is not as accurate because it does not adjust for inflation, but real does. And how they do this is by using current prices in nominal GDP and a constant price in real. So for example, let's say that four trucks are produced in 2018 at $20,000 each. Then in 2019, four trucks were produced at $40,000 each. Nominal GDP would use 20,000 for 2018 and 40,000 for 2019, and it would go up. But you see why this is inaccurate. The whole point of GDP is measuring how much is produced. Why is it going up when the only thing that actually went up was inflation? So what real GDP does is it takes the current prices and just sets one constant base year prices. So we'll say 2018 is the base year, and so they'll always just use $20,000 for the price of a truck. And so what we'll see now is we use real is that the number would be the same. It would be four trucks produced at $20,000 each both years. Real GDP would not go up, which is an accurate way of saying nothing additional was produced, which is the whole point of real GDP. So nominal GDP, it may be going up because more was produced, there was inflation, or both. We can't distinguish. But real shows just how much was being produced. Now with that, since we're talking about inflation and GDP, you can actually measure the amount of inflation within GDP with this formula called the GDP deflator. The GDP deflator is a price index, just like CPI, but it measures inflation within GDP. It's just a number, not a percentage, not a dollar sign. And what it does is if you take the nominal GDP and divide it by the real and multiply that number by 100, it shows you how much inflation there was within GDP. You can also use this formula to solve for real GDP if you know the nominal and the deflator. You just flip the denominators. So if I was trying to find real GDP, I would take the nominal, divide it by the deflator and times that number by 100, and it would take the inflation out of the nominal and give me just the real, just how much was produced. So now we're gonna talk about inflation in terms of how we really measure it in the American economy through what's known as Consumer Price Index, or CPI. CPI looks at inflation by measuring a market basket of goods that a typical family consumes. So they look around the country and say, what do American families spend money on? Food, transportation, clothing, education. And they use this, these statistics to make up what's known as a market basket. They measure the prices of those same goods year to year to year. And if the prices of those market baskets of goods have gone up, they say there's been inflation in America. So it's very simplistic. In fact, so simplistic that there are three criticisms that show that it ends up overstating how much inflation there was in a year. And those three criticisms are the substitution bias. Because what about goods outside the market basket that are cheaper? CPI doesn't show that. The second one is introduction of new goods. What about goods that are outside the market basket that are new that aren't included? Doesn't show that. The third thing is quality changes. What about quality changes of goods inside and outside of the market basket? CPI doesn't show that. And why this is a problem is it ends up overstating inflation by about one percentage point a year, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize we consider high inflation over five and healthy inflation two to three. One percentage point can make the difference between healthy growth and thinking we're suffering from inflation. So there's no consensus on how to fix this though, because it'd be really expensive to change the whole process. Now with the math, we take the values of the market basket to determine the CPI and have the formula here. And I'm going to calculate the CPI for the base year, which I put as 2018. And if I'm calculating the CPI for the base year, the 4,000 is the current year I'm calculating. And the 4,000 market basket is the number for the base year's market basket price as well. And then I times that by 100, which illustrates a very important point. Because you are dividing the same number divided by itself, 
and timesing it by 100, no matter what they give you for the base year's market basket, your CPI for the base year will always end up equaling 100. College Board expects you to know that without even giving you the dollar value of the market basket for the base year. So, but I can also use this information to calculate the CPI for 2019. So now the current year I'm calculating is 2019, so 8,000 would go on top. The base year is still 2018, so 4,000 would go on the bottom, times by 100. And I would say my CPI for 2019 is 200. So clearly there's been inflation. And how I'm going to calculate how much inflation there's been, I'm going to use the percentage change formula, which is year 2 minus year 1 over year 1 times by 100. Or in this scenario, 200 minus 100 over 100 times by 100, and I would say there was 100% inflation between 2018 and 2019. And those are the formulas with CPI. Now really quickly before I move to the types of inflations, I've given you two types of inflation, the GDP deflator and CPI. There are two differences that separate these numbers, summarized by CPI has to be in the market basket, the GDP deflator it has to be in GDP. But to break it down, those two differences, CPI measures anything produced anywhere in the world as long as that good counts in the market basket. The GDP deflator only counts things that count in GDP, so only things made in America. The second difference is CPI is a fixed quantity. It's those exact goods in that fixed market basket. The GDP deflator is an ever-changing quantity because it measures GDP as GDP changes. So those two differences cause the numbers to diverge. Now the types of inflation are very important because they illustrate that not all inflation is bad. And so we have demand pull inflation first. Demand pull inflation looks at consumers spending money, which drives up demand and drives up equilibrium price level. But when demand increases, GDP increases as well, which means small amounts of demand pull inflation represent growth. So 2 to 3% consumer spending more money and creating that 2 to 3% inflation is considered normal and healthy as a type of inflation. Cost push inflation is always bad. Cost push inflation deals with resource costs, wars, wages, natural disasters, oil, steel, and lumber. And if the prices of those increase, supply moves to the left, which drives up price level, which drives GDP down, which ends up driving unemployment up. And why this is a problem is now we have inflation and unemployment at the same time, which is stagflation, when everyone's really, really miserable. So cost push inflation is going to create the worst thing an economy has. The last one is it uses often. The quantity theory does exist, too much money in the economy, but the one you'll see on the AP exam is either demand pull or cost push because those are the ones that happen on the aggregate model all the time. The final thing I want to talk about with inflation is who's helped and hurt by inflation because not everyone is negatively affected by inflation. Who's hurt by inflation are savers because their money in their savings account doesn't feel like it's worth as much. Lenders, because it doesn't feel like they're receiving as much in profit when they're lending money and then there's inflation. And fixed income earners, because if my income's staying the same but price levels are going up, my money doesn't buy as much as it used to. But if you make flexible wages, your income goes up with the same amount as inflation, you're not affected. And some people are actually helped by inflation. And those are summarized by debtors and borrowers. If I have debt, and my wages go up, but I owe the same amount, it doesn't feel like I owe as much because I can pay that debt back easier. Same thing with borrowers. If I borrow money from someone and there's inflation, it doesn't feel like I owe as much anymore, which is illustrated by probably the most important formula in this unit, the real interest rate formula. This formula is real equals nominal minus inflation, and it illustrates how borrowers and lenders are affected by inflation. So, Let's say that I have a loan a bank gave me, and banks have to give loans with a nominal interest rate because they don't know what inflation is going to be. So I have a nominal interest rate loan of 10%. But then in that year, there was 5% inflation. It'll end up that it only feels like with my loan, I'm only paying 5% back in interest. And this illustrates again how the borrower is helped. Now it only feels like I'm paying back 5% interest instead of the 10 I signed up for. 
With the lender, it illustrates how they're hurt. Now the bank only feels like they're receiving 5% back in interest when they gave the loan at 10%. The final topic from Unit 2 is unemployment. Now unemployment's not hard. The formulas are pretty basic. Just make sure you have them down. Make sure you remember you only technically count as unemployed in America if you are collecting unemployment compensation, meaning you're applying for five jobs a week, and in return you get a check from the government that shows you're actively searching for work. So if you're discouraged or you never found a job after college, you don't count as anything. And then there are four types of unemployment, and you just really need to know the key words to keep these straight. Frictional unemployment, the key word is choice. So if I leave my job to go find another better job, or if I'm laid off but I take my time in being choosy and finding a new job, I'd be frictionally unemployed. The difference is, if I'm laid off and collecting unemployment compensation and being picky while finding another job, I am frictionally unemployed and count in the unemployment rate. If I quit my job to go find a better one, I don't count in the unemployment rate, but I'm still frictionally unemployed. So these four don't necessarily mean you count in the unemployment rate. Structural, the most important keyword is skills. You don't have the skills to do the job and you're laid off. But also, several th things to note. If your job is outsourced, you're structurally unemployed. If there's a change in technology, meaning that let's say your job is replaced by machinery, or a change in demand, where people just don't want to buy your product anymore and that's why you're unemployed, those all go under structural. Seasonal, the keyword is season. You're a lifeguard, your job ends at the end of the summer, you're seasonally unemployed. And those three are all considered normal and healthy in parts of the economy. We want people to be choosy. We want people to get skills and seasons happen. But what's important, the one that's not healthy for the economy, is cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is unemployment that goes up or down with GDP. So in a recession, we will have high cyclical unemployment, which means we're technically considered at full employment when we have no cyclical unemployment. We still have structural, we still have frictional and seasonal, which is why full employment is usually around 4%, because it just means we have no cyclical unemployment. So the formulas are really easy. Just make sure to memorize them. The unemployment rate is the unemployed over the labor force times by 100. The labor force participation rate is the labor force over the adult population by one, times by 100. The last thing I want to cover with unemployment goes with our PPC graph from Unit 1 because it actually illustrates something on the PPC graph you need to keep in mind. It's the GDP gap. So the GDP gap is the difference between where we want to be at full employment and where we are if we're in a recession. So it's the difference between those two points. And with that gap, we measure it by Ocon's law. And it shows how important the relationship between inflation and unemployment is. Ocon's law says that for every one percentage point increase in unemployment, there's a 2% decrease in GDP. So it shows that A, there's always an inverse relationship between the two, and B, that unemployment has a huge impact on whether or not we are in a recession. And that measures the GDP gap. And that is the end of the Unit 2 AP Macroeconomics Review.